the five minute rule is, um, if it's not going to matter in five years, don't think about it longer than five minutes. Don't sulk about it longer than five minutes. And, um, I, I truly believe that that is, a, it's, it's such a powerful thing. We spend so much time being negative and we spend so much time exuding a bad energy because mm-hmm. of something that happens when we have literally no control over that. And it's already happened. And the only thing that we're doing is feeding into more negativity for our future. So why are we going to do it? Why are we going to spend time on it? Why are we going to think about it? Just stop thinking about it and then uh, figure out what you got to do to make today productive now and move on because in five years, that's not going to matter. Hey, hey, we're back. Episode 167. I'm your host, Harry Duran. If you're new and this is your first time, then this is the show where we interview amazing podcasters like today's guest, Travis Chappell. More on him in a second. If you missed last week's episode, we had one that would quite possibly put you to sleep. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. It's Drew Ackerman, host of the Sleep With Me podcast. Fascinating, fascinating premise for a show. And he delivered the goods on this episode. You'll learn why it was uh, something that he felt he needed to create and why he was the perfect person to do it. So we connected a couple of times at PodFest and he's just a great guy and I'm really happy to tell his story. So that's episode 166. Check that out. Check out the podcast uh, show notes as well because we spend a lot of time doing that. A lot of TLC goes into that as well. This week, as I mentioned, Travis Chappell, host of Build Your Network. Travis is really interesting. He's a young podcaster with a new podcast, but he's very, very quickly um, made a name for himself. And it's, I think, because of his, not I think, sorry, I know, it's because of his his work ethic. Uh, we talk about how he connected with John Lee Dumas and how that started this whirlwind tour of networking and connections and conferences. And he talks about the mind shift he had while doing John's mastermind in Puerto Rico. And that led him to exactly where he is today. He talks about his story of being a door-to-door, a very successful door-to-door salesman. And and he talks about why he believes he has been so successful doing that. And there's a funny story there about the first time he ever sold an alarm system. Make sure you listen out for that. We find out where he gets his work ethic from and the five-minute rule he tries to live by. So this is a really, really inspiring episode with someone that i was been happy to connect with. Again, another shout-out to John Corcoran, who you've heard me mention before. Episode 24 of Podcast Junkies. Yes, that's way back in 2014. He had an event in Santa Barbara called Rise 25, and Travis was there. We connected. I've since been on Travis's show, Build Your Network, which you'll hear him talk about. And now I'm um, more than happy to return the favor. Really good episode. I, I know you're going to get a lot out of it. As some of you may know, I actually own a production company. It's called Fullcast. I'm getting started with a new case study program, and I'm looking for a few specific people. If you are serious and ready to launch your podcast, you're running a profitable business, you have the time to start working on your show starting this month, you have somewhere in the range of 300 people on your email list, you're friendly and you're coachable, and above all, you can keep a secret, then send me an email, harry at Podcast Junkies, and all you have to do is put the words case study in the subject line or in the body at the first part of the email and send it over and I'll be in touch soon. Make sure you stay to the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag. But for now, enjoy my conversation with Mr. Travis. So Travis Chappell, host of Build Your Network. So happy to have you finally on Podcast Junkies. Yeah, what's up, Harry? How's it, how's it going, man? It's so interesting. Been been watching a lot of what you're doing and uh, getting caught up on the episodes. You're turning out a bunch of content, doing three a week. So <laughs> it's needless a lot. To, yeah, needless to say, um, I know we'll get a little, a little bit into the backstory. But you know, overall, if 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 you had to sum up your podcasting experience in uh, one to to three words so far, how would you describe it? Uh, amazing. Um, hard. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's say, let's go for a third one here. Um, unexpected. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk. Let's dive into the hard a little bit. What's what's been so hard so far? <laughs> Putting out three shows a week <laughs> is 
I mean, been proven to be a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Basically, like my my first um, exposure in the podcasting world was with Entrepreneur on Fire, yeah, which was like an unfair exposure because <laughs> you know you see seven days a week, and I'm like, oh, well, seven days? Oh, I could do yeah. three days, yeah. <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be, especially if you're trying to get like good quality content, mm -hmm. and when they're all guests too, because then that makes it more difficult with scheduling and. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then you schedule and then you do the episode and then you have to edit it and then have it up for release and all that good stuff. So it's definitely proven to be more difficult than I thought it was going to be. So talk a little bit how you are about the, the time you were introduced or how you connected with John Lee Dumas. I know the story we talked about it when we met in Santa Barbara. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot, I think for the listener, there's going to be a lot of themes about networking that we're going to be weaving into this conversation. So I thought yeah. it was interesting. Um, so I'd like you to share that. Yeah, definitely. So, well, let's go back to, let's see, 2016. And I was just then discovering podcasting. So I didn't really listen to a lot of podcasts before 2016. I was um, not really doing a lot of personal development, to be honest. And so in 2016, I really boosted that and started listening to podcasts, audio books, reading books, um, all that good stuff, watching YouTube videos, whatever I could get my hands on, because I just started learning so much and realizing what I was missing out on. And a buddy of mine turned me on to EO Fire, and I started listening to that show, following John's you know, income reports, and that's really what intrigued me. I was just like, how do you make this much money doing a podcast. That's incredible. Yeah. And uh, so I uh, unknowingly fell into the John Lee Dumas funnel. Um, and uh, as soon as I started listening, there's a CTA in there about his free podcast course. And uh, it was something that kind of intrigued me. So I was like, well, I'll go check that out and see what's good. And went to freepodcastcourse.com, which if anybody's listening and you're wondering how to do any of this stuff, it is a great place to start um, because it gives you a ton of free content on how to start a podcast. And so I, um, disclaimer though, it is kind of old content mm -hmm. like through two, three years ago. So some of the stuff isn't really up to date, but principles, it's still a really good thing to, a really good place to start. So I, uh, I took that course and, and then let's see, I was at, at basically at that point I was sold. I was like, all right, well, I think I can do this. You know, it doesn't seem like insanely difficult. And then there's a lot of people who have already done it. So I just need to rub shoulders with the people who have done it and figure out how I can do it. So I reached out to John and asked him for a mentorship mm -hmm. and, uh, which he had already said that like, Hey, look, I don't do these anymore. So I, but he reached out to me and put me and I'll put you in touch with somebody that does do them. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. So I reached out, he put me in touch with a guy named Jeff Brown of the read to lead podcast. And Jeff's a great dude. And, um, he knows what he's doing as far as podcasting goes. And as far as we're just radio broadcasting, he's been in radio and stuff for like oh, yeah. 30 years years or something like that. Um, so I hired him as, as my podcast mentor. And then let's see a little bit, a little bit before that, actually, I was traveling down in Central America. It was actually a year ago, like right now, a year ago, I think I was in Panama and, um, probably even probably at this point, it's probably even close to the day that I saw a Instagram story from, from JLD. And he was like, Hey, uh, everybody, I'm hosting a, um, a mastermind, a closed mastermind event here at my house in Puerto Rico. If you're interested or whatever, you know, then go check out my Kickstarter campaign. It has more details. And it was basically when he was launching the free, the uh, mastery journal. And it was this big Kickstarter campaign. And that was one of the perks. If you donated a certain amount of money to the campaign, uh, you got to go to John's house for three or four days in Puerto Rico with four or five other entrepreneurs or podcasters or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And it was not cheap. <laughs> so <laughs> it took me like, so I was in Panama when I saw it yeah. and I immediately wanted to do it, but I was like, dang, I've never spent this kind of money on something like this before. Is it going to be worth it? I'm going to get my um, value out of it. And so long story short, I, during those next few days, like week and a half, almost two weeks that I was trying to make up my mind, I talked to my wife, I looked at my finances, looked at income. And then um, I was just like, you know what, if this is something that I really want to do, 
Like if this is a, a, you know, a career path that I want to take, if it's going to be part of my life, then I need to make sure that I'm doing it the right way because you can figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. Like, don't get me wrong. You don't have to spend a lot of money because it was 6,500 bucks just to go out there. Plus the plane ticket there and back. So I was out with food, expenses, travel, everything, like almost $8,000 for this, you know, three or four days in Puerto Rico with John. And, um, so I had one of two choices, basically start and then take the next year and a half to figure out how to do all this stuff or pay a lot of money and shorten that runway by a year and three months, you know, so where I could gain as much knowledge as I could have gained by myself, but just in a very small fraction of the time. And I just knew that on my personality, if I didn't do that, then I probably would have not ever hit the point um, where I'm at right now because it would have taken me an extra, you know, year, year and a half. I don't know if I'd have the patience to get past those two to three years of a runway at that point. So I invested the money. Um, by the time I was leaving, I was, was, was taking off from Belize to fly to Florida to meet my wife, to go on a cruise for our anniversary. And that's when I was like, you know what? I just got to do it. So I booked, Booked the mastermind, went out to John's house in May, and then during the the time in between, I booked the that I booked the mastermind and the, and going to his house. That's when I had my coaching with with Jeff. Mm -hmm. So I was getting a lot of um, you know I was getting a good head start from Jeff because he brought me through the entire process of actually putting your show on iTunes, all the technical stuff of yeah. running a podcast. And so I, I go out to, to John's house and there was basically, there was, there was one point where that I really remember, um, thinking like having a, a specific mindset shift that I think is really what allows, allowed me to get to the point where I am now. And that was shifting my mindset from thinking like, Hey, what am I going to get out of this? Like, how am I going to make this worth the money that I just spent on it? and thinking, what can I put into this? Mm -hmm. What kind of value can I bring to the table? How can I help um, somebody like John Lee Dumas? And, you know, it doesn't seem surface level like I can do anything. The dude is insanely connected. He's had all the best, the best people on his show. He makes a lot of money. Like, what am I going to bring to the table that he doesn't already have? Yeah. And uh, so I was just looking for an opportunity to do that. And he mentioned that he was going to be a podcast movement. He was one of the keynotes there at podcast movement and that um, he had a booth of freedom and mastery journals that he wanted to sell. And he was like, I have a guy working it. He was like, but Travis, I was wondering if you could maybe um, train him for a second just because you have a lot of experience in sales. And so I was like, bro, I'll just work the booth for you if that's, you know, what you want me to do. Like, that's totally fine. I'll do that. So he was like, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be really cool. So I go to podcast movement and I work his booth there. It goes really well. And then he invites me to go to thrive, which is a conference that's in Vegas that he spoke at that's put on by Cole Hatter. Yep. And, uh, so that's how I got introduced to Cole and now I'm in Cole's mastermind, uh, uh, Cole's mastermind. And I just, spoke there this past weekend alongside of people like Steve Sims and Naveen Jain and, you know, Cole and then a couple other people. And I was one of like, I think two people that were actually in the mastermind that got to speak to the mastermind, but it was just a really cool experience. And all of this has stemmed from basically deciding that if I want to be one of the best podcasters out there, I have to rub shoulders with the best podcasters out there and figure out what they're doing. And then sometimes in order to do that, you got to pay to make it happen. Yeah. And that's what I did. And I've, you know, uh, it's been going really well ever since. So there's a lot of things to unpack there because I think too many times people try to do just a one-to-one -one comparison of like, what am I going to get for this dollar amount? You know, if I'm putting a yep. dollar in, am I immediately going to get my dollar back? And they're so concerned with the short-term ROI that they lose focus of strategically making an investment that will pay off dividends. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a couple, there's so many different ways you could have spent that money in so many different places you could have gone to. But I think you realized that because of the exposure John had, um, and he's just an all around good guy as well, because I've, I've had the opportunity to hang out with him a couple of times now at mm -hmm. Pod Podcast Movement, and he's been on the show as well. And, you know, he's, 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 sort of like the right place, right time. Not everyone can do what he, he's done because he's got right. that military background, but he's he shows you what's possible. And I think uh, mm -hmm. I get the sense that that's what appealed to you because um, you've been able to shorten the learning curve and shorten the exposure curve, the networking curve because of 
also because of the topic of your show. So it's called Build Your Network. You're having conversations with people about the importance of networking. You've been gracious enough to allow me to be on the show, and, and thank you for that. I had a blast. And mm -hmm. I've, I've been, uh, it's one of my, you know, go-to podcasts. I, I'll, I'll definitely, I, I want you to know that because I, I'm, I'm interested to see who you're bringing on. And I've, I've, yeah. I've, and I've sent some folks your way as well because I think, it, you know, I see the value of them being on, on a show like yours. And I know that it's still growing, but I, I do see the potential of what your show is doing. So I'm curious what other formats or what other topics you had besides networking, or is that the one you thought from the, be from the beginning that would be the best fit for you? Yeah. So first of all, thank you. Um, I appreciate you saying that. It means a lot. As I know you deal with a lot of podcasts and talk to a lot of podcasters. So it means a lot that you're uh, saying that about my show. Um, but the answer is no, I did not start with, with that topic. Um, it basically stemmed from, uh, the kind of a blue ocean strategy without me really realizing it at the time. I just knew that I type. So my background is in sales, right? Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of door to door sales, a lot of, uh, retail sales and like sales at home shows and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I train a lot on closing the sale, on getting a signature on a, on paperwork, like pitching and, you know, just selling stuff. So I was like, Oh, I'll just talk about sales. And I went to iTunes and I searched sales and there's only like 58,000 shows in iTunes that talk about sales. Right. Yeah. So I was like, well, that's probably not going to fly at this point. I might be a little bit too late to the game. And, uh, so I looked and I was like, well, what's another thing that I know a little bit about? but I would like to know more about and I would like to talk to more people about. And uh, networking was just like the one that came to my mind second, but I figured based on my experience with searching for sales, I was like, there's got to be a million shows on networking out there too. And I searched for it and it, the, to my surprise, it just wasn't, you know, like I, there, there's individual episodes that'll pop up. Like if yeah. you go search, like how to network, are you networking or something in iTunes? Like, you know, you'll see a little bit of art of charm that, that comes up because Jordan Harbinger touches on networking quite a bit in his show. Um, art of manliness even had a couple episodes. Like there's a couple, there's one or two that will chat about it every once in a while, but there's no show that talked to every single episode specifically about this one topic and really took a deep dive into it. So I was like, well, that doesn't exist. That's crazy, first of all. But I may as well be the one to put it out there, <laughs> you know. Um, so I basically started with that. And then it was kind of selfish on my part because I just wanted to go talk to a lot of cool people. And I wanted my inner circle to grow. And I wanted to build my own network. And uh, so having a podcast about how to do that seemed like a really natural way to do it. And, it, and, it's, and it's worked really well so far. I think what's fascinating is we new podcasters lose sight of the fact that this is such a powerful medium for us to do just what you're doing. And, and I've, um, I mean, that's what I've done over the past three and a half years, 157 plus episodes. I've just had amazing conversations with people who inspired me to start podcasting. I just spoke to Cliff Ravenscraft. He just published that, Pat Flynn, uh, and you know Dave Jackson, some of these old school podcasters been around doing it for 10 years. But more recently, some people in the podcasting space um, and people who are, uh, you know, slightly connected to podcasting. I just interviewed um, Andrew Mason, the former CEO of Groupon, which is so random um, because his team reached out via the site and said, hey, you, you know, podcast junkies, you know, with a name like that, it gets attention. Yeah. And it was just fascinating because they're like, oh, yeah, he's starting this new service called Descript, which is transcription service. It's automated transcription, but it allows you if you edit the text, it'll modify the wave file at the same time. Fantastic. Huh. Yeah. So he's got some like, uh, you know, interesting, uh, in smart intelligence, like uh, AI stuff, to, I think going on the machine learning type stuff. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see what he does. But it was fun because it was just one of those, you know, because of my podcast stories, that <laughs> these relationships right. that I had a conversation with, with someone of, of that caliber. So it's been really interesting. And I think we overlooked the fact that if we treated every single one of the guests that came on our show with like, you know, white glove treatment, I always, I always say treat your guests like gold. I think it's just we have that time and and if we're just so focused like my my only focus right now is making this the best conversation possible and that's why i do these on video because i love to have that one-to-one -one connection mm -hmm. and too many times you see this happen at a, at a at a real conference in person conference you know people are looking over the shoulder and like oh who's that walking down the hallway i need to follow that person or i need to have that one-off conversation you know they're not focused and it's just like and it's I see that that's what you're doing with with your with your episodes and so i'm wondering um is this something that you feel like you're 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 doing three a week? So you're, you're building up the, the the muscle rapidly. Do you, have you seen that you're getting better at these types of conversations and and being able to go deep quick? Because I know they're they're not they're not long. <laughs> oh man, 
Uh, yes, a hundred percent. Yes. And if you're listening, you just go listen to my early episodes, <laughs> you know, like if you're listening right now, go to build your network on iTunes or, or cast box or stitch or whatever you're listening on. And, uh, uh, go listen to like my most recent episode, like go <laughs> listen to my episode with JP Sears or someone like that. Um, or even Harry's episode even, um, and then go listen to like, you know, episode 12 or something. And, uh, you're going to notice a stark contrast, uh, between the way that I used to do it and the way that I do it now. And, uh, yeah. but yes, I think the answer to that is, is definitely, I have seen a big jump and, uh, it has been because I think uh, that I've been putting out three a week. Yeah. So it's forced me to really exercise that muscle quite a bit. And then I've been really trying to focus on it on purpose by listening to people who are great interviews that I really respect, like um, like Jordan Harbinger is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, had the chance to hang out with him in Australia for a little bit, and I asked him what the number one skill he's worked on for his business over the last few years. And he said, interviewing, hands down, like 100%. Interviewing is the number one skill I work on. He spends eight to 10 hours researching every single guest that comes on his show. Yeah. And uh, so I, I picked up a lot of stuff from hanging out with people like that. And uh, really, I, I just never realized that that was a thing that I was going to have to do. You know, like I was just like, oh yeah, you ask questions and then people answer it. And then like, that's it, yeah. <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, it does, it does actually st- take like a skill set to actually start doing that. And, um, so now it's something that, that I, I try to really get better at on a, you know, interview by interview basis so that I can bring out the best content that I possibly can because ultimately content's king, right? Yeah. And then what's been interesting for me is that I've been focused more on interview type shows and interviewers, you know, people like Larry King, you know, Terry Gross. I'm just, I'm paying, I find myself paying more attention. Alec Baldwin has a great podcast. Tim Ferriss does a great job. Tim you know, Ferriss is one of the best. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, um, you know, folks like Jordan, uh, Kevin Rose does good interviews as well. And just it's just been fascinating because every once in a while I, I'll hear one question or I'll, I'll see how they're formatting a question or even setting up the question. And, and it is a, a, it's like a science. It's, it's an art. Um, and I think but it's like everything else, like we have to do it repetitively to keep getting better and better at it. Definitely. Yeah. You got to, you have to, you have to just do it a lot. And so uh, that's something that can be said for you in sales. Uh, How did you end up in door to door sales? (laughs) Uh, That's a good question. So uh, it was really just kind of happened into it. I heard a buddy of mine when I was in college and he was talking to somebody um, and I was just like, I was just there part of the conversation and he said something because I remember like the summer before he had worked two jobs, mm-hmm. um, like two 40 hour week jobs, two full-time jobs. He's working 80 hours a week at like two minimum wage jobs, like Walgreens and like another place. And, and I remember hearing him say like, yeah, I worked 20 hours last week and I made more money on this paycheck than I did when I was working 80 hours a week last summer. And they like caught my attention. I was like, wait, what would you say? Like, what, say that one more time. <laughs> and he told me again and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And uh, so I was like, can you give me an interview with, uh, with the company? And he was like, yeah, yeah, definitely. So he reached out to a supervisor, I got an interview and I started in door to door. It was kind of just by happenstance, mm-hmm. but I just kind of caught on to it. And First week I got promoted, uh, five weeks later I got promoted again, two months later I got promoted a third time, I was running my own team at that point, um, and then we started recruiting in a bunch of door-to-door sales reps, and um, I was training them and running them, and we were running a really good operation, and basically I've just been doing that ever since, just hopping around in different inter- industries, figuring out different um, different business uh, models and stuff like that. Um, so now I'm in the water business with uh, whole home water machines and stuff, and I have a team of guys that uh, we go out knock in and uh, sell uh, water machines out to our customers. I love that story, and it's something we talked about when we 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 were connected at uh, John Corcoran. Shout out to John Corcoran, yeah. another mm-hmm. fabulous networker, and, and one of the first people in this yes. space. So I, th- you know, just really noticed that was really good because he's he's conscious about networking, about the fact that he's networking, and I picked up on that, and so it just made sense, obviously, that I would meet him at at your event, Rise Twenty Five in Santa Barbara. Uh, a couple of months ago. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were all talking to you because you were telling us the door to door story. And we're like, well, you should do a podcast or you should talk about door to door (laughs) sales. And you're like, nah, I don't think that's what I want to do because I really (laughs) really love this. And I, and you made the right decision because, you know, after listening to the show and seeing, you know, your journey so far since just even since the time that we've met, it's clear that you're in your element. And I, and I feel like this is more of where you're going to be moving towards. I'm, I'm curious why you think you were successful in door-to-door sales when a lot of the people who, you know, probably took the same path, you know, were just as excited as you were about the, uh, you know, the revenue opportunity, but you seem to have something in your DNA that allows you, allowed you to succeed at that. What do you think that is? Um, 
it's a good question. It's something I've really been trying to analyze just for myself when I try to recruit people into the company, like what's going to separate um, somebody who makes this happen to somebody who doesn't make this happen. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I can point back to is I think that I have a really high tolerance of hearing the word no. Um, and a lot of people's tolerance is very, very, very low. Mm -hmm. So I just, this is what actually what I gave my speech on at the, um, at the thrive mastermind this past weekend. And, uh, it's so crucial to be able to take yourself out of the situation and detach yourself emotionally from somebody telling, you no. and a lot of people can't do that. They take it really personally Mm -hmm. and it starts to, you know, chip away at their confidence. And if you don't have enough confidence, then you don't have enough courage to go back out and ask the question again and, um, and try to get more sales. So, um, every time someone tells, you, no, it takes, you know, a withdrawal from your confidence bank, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I, the way I try to explain it to people is like, look, your con- it's, confidence is like a bank account, yeah. right? And every time you, someone, someone tells, you, no, you're going to have a withdrawal from that bank account. Every time someone tells you, yes, you have a deposit in the bank account. So there's a couple of ways to make sure that your bank account stays full. Um, number one is try to make more deposits, mm-hmm. right? So like, um, trainings, coaching, practicing, doing it, like all those kinds of things will help to make you deposit, make you make deposits in your confidence bank. Mm-hmm. But then the second way to make sure your confidence bank is full is to mitigate the amount that is withdrawn every time someone tells you no. Um, and that's really where I think it, I think door to door people are separated from a lot of uh, other industries is that when someone tells us, no, it's just, it takes such a small thing away. You know, like I, I don't, I don't coach people to learn to love no's cause I think that's a bunch of bull crap. Like I don't think anybody's ever going to love hearing the word no. And if you do, then there's something psychologically wrong there, first of all. Yeah. And then I, I understand the mindset behind it where people are like, Hey, you should learn to love no's because then if you love no's and you don't have to, anything to fear and that'll help you get more yeses. And it's like, okay, I kind of understand where you're coming yeah. from, but if you love a no, then you're probably not going to go through the pain enough to like get better so that next time you get a yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, so totally. like you're hearing no all the time and you're like, Oh, this is great. Whatever. Who cares? Then you might still get sales, you know, like, because it's just a numbers game for you at that point. Um, but I teach people like, look, getting a no should bother you, but the amount that it should bother you is should be very, very, very small. So like, you know, if, if a no would normally withdraw a hundred quote unquote confidence points from somebody's bank account, you need to make sure that you can try to figure out a way to get that down to like where it's only withdrawing 10 points or mm. 15 points or five points. Um, so where like, it's going to take your confidence level down a little bit. It will, like, I don't care who you are. Yeah. Um, you can be the president of the United States still heard the, hear the word no. And it's like, ah, man, I thought I was going to get a yes on that one. You know what I mean? Now you can get better and increase the percentage of people who say yes. But the bottom line is you're not going to get through that learning curve to get better if you're not okay with hearing no's to begin with. And I always liken it to playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I was first learning to play the guitar, it was all acoustic. So basically my fingers were hurting like crazy because you have to learn how to press those strings down, those steel strings. And, uh, what I literally, it sounds stupid now, but, um, I literally thought, man, I I just, maybe I'm just one of those people just can't learn how to play the guitar. I just, I'm not gonna be able to learn it, you know? And it sounds ridiculous now, but I legitimately thought that because it was so hard to like get past that. But I kept at it and he kept at it and kept at it. And then what happens over time is what your fingers start getting calluses on them. So when you start pressing those strings down, it doesn't hurt anymore. You can play better. You can learn how to switch chords better. You can start making actual chords that sound like real music instead mm-hmm. of just a bunch of buzzing strings. But most people won't make it past that three or four month learning curve to get those calluses on their fingers to get to where they really start playing music. And it's the same thing with door to door, same thing with sales. If you can't make it past that, that learning curve, however long it may be, and you can't make it past the pain of hearing no that many times, then you're not going to get to the point where you're going to be able to make a lot of money with it. I love it because it's it's almost like the gamification of no's. <laughs> you yeah. make it a challenge to yourself. And then the other thing that resonated with me was this idea that no, it has a it has a vibrational frequency to it that's not in alignment with like me. Because you know when you say yes, yes is just like if you hear a yes and you get like t- the chills, right? <laughs> Especially mm-hmm. if it's a yes you're looking forward to or or yes you're like worked hard on. And so I I I do agree that there is a power in no, but I love the fact that you can sort of 
control it. Let's so put a volume control on no. And you're saying it's just it's just one of many that I'm going to get, and you know, and never feel like it's the one. You know, it's the only one. And I think when you see it in the aggregate of all the nodes you'll probably get in your lifetime, you're like, ah, this is just another drop in the bucket. Right. Right. You, exactly. And understanding that, like, nobody is ever going to close a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Right. So, getting a no is just like one step closer to getting a yes. Like every time I hear the word no, like they hear six, seven, eight no's in a row, it's like, dang, I'm getting really close to I'm a yes due. here. I'm like, due. <laughs> yeah, because like you can look at the numbers, right? Yeah. Literally, like it's just logic. Like you look at the numbers. So like if I, I know that if I knock on 10 doors and I, I can sell one deal in 10 doors, then like if I'm at like door 12 or door 13 and I still haven't sold the deal, it's like, man, I'm getting a yes on the next these <laughs> next like three or four doors. There's gonna like a yes is coming for sure, yeah. like really, really quick because I've gotten a lot of no's recently. So a yes is like, on the brink, you know what I mean? Yeah. But most people can't look past that because they ha they feel that emotional toll that a no takes on you and they don't, they, they focus on the no's, they don't focus on the yeses and whatever you focus on is what you're going to get more of. So if you focus on the no's, you're going to get more no's. You focus mm -hmm. on the yeses, you're going to get more yeses. You'll always look for what you believe to be true regardless of if it actually is true. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Do you remember your first so. ever sale to any of anything? Oh man. Um, first time you ever got I, paid for anything. I don't remember my first, my first, uh, door to door appointment that I set. Or even um, before then, the I, first time you ever sold anything. Yeah. I remember, um, I remember, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go I'll fast forward a little bit past that. I remember my first time selling an alarm system. So when I, when I was in solar, I remember like thinking that, um, like in the door to door industries, alarm reps were the ones where it was like, man, those people are cold, you know, like we, we sell solar and like <laughs> it takes, takes multiple touches and like, it's still really difficult. But like, yeah. I remember thinking like there's pest control guys, there's alarm guys, like those dudes are just, they're, they're just cold dudes. Like, I, I don't know if I could do that. So when I first started in alarms, it was kind of like, okay, we'll see what I can do, you know? And, uh, so I remember the first, my first day knocking, like within a couple of hours, I, I remember selling a deal and coming out with a contract and being just like super stoked. I was like, all right, <laughs> you know, like now this is something that, you know, I know I'm going to move forward with. And that was actually the first year I ever made six figures door to door was, um, in door to door alarms. And it was that year. Where does your work ethic come from? Cause I've, I've seen it just in like, um, you know, the consistency with the podcast, having met you in person, um, you know, hearing you on the conversations with your guests, seeing what you're doing on Instagram, seeing what you're doing with the Facebook group. I, I get the sense, uh, and it's a, it's like a hunch that you've got this like really strong work ethic. Um, you take pride in what you do and I'm wondering uh, where that comes from. Yeah. A good question. First of all, it's, it's funny that it's funny that you say that and I, and I'm, I'm glad that that's what I portray. But to be honest, as far as like hours in a day goes, mm -hmm. like I am pretty lazy. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but at the same time, my mind is always going. Yeah. You know, like I'm always working, but I'm never working. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, Elabor like if you elaborate to, on that. Yeah. So like if you talked to my parents and you were like, "Do you think Travis is always uh, you know a hard worker or whatever?" They'd be like, "No." <laughs> you know, <laughs> like like my dad and my mom like they're very very hard workers and they inst and instilled that in me a lot growing up and uh, I hated every second of it. Yeah. So like when we would go out and uh, we were we grew, I grew up on two acres. So like we I had we had three separate lawns. We had a front lawn, we had a back lawn, and we had a back back lawn that was separated by a block wall and stuff. So it took me like almost two hours to mow and edge all of our lawns, and I had to do it every week and I hated every second of it. And, uh, and then plus like on Sundays and Saturdays, those are like when my dad was home, you know, like he liked to do yard work and like clean up the yard and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so he made me come help him yeah. and I never wanted to do any of it. And I, I complained does. and I whined <laughs> and yeah, exactly. Um, and, but my dad loved it. My dad, my dad's in real estate. And so that was like, that was a way for him to escape. Like, yeah. and it still is. He like, he likes doing that kind of stuff. Him and my mom, like they, they like taking care of the yard. That's just how they relax. My dad was like, if I could do this and make as much money as I do in real estate, I would do this. And my head I was like I would never do this <laughs> uh, which was ironic that landscaping was my first business actually yeah. um, but it was just because I knew how to do it because I learned a lot growing up but um but anyway, getting back to the to the question is, uh, my my parents raised me with a with a really strong work ethic, yeah. and in high school and in college, I had a I, I worked a lot, and um, you know, in college, I had 
20, 21 credits a semester. I finished in three and a half years. And then, um, I had, uh, the first couple of years I was on the basketball team and we had practice from nine o'clock to 11 o'clock every night, plus projects and all that stuff, plus work. So like, I, you know, I did a lot during those times, but since college, my workload has actually gone down quite a bit. So in door to door, my schedule, um, is I work when people don't work. Mm -hmm. So I don't go out in the mornings. There's not a lot of people home. Yeah. So I'll go out in the afternoons for three or four hours and like do all my production in those three or four peak hours. And then that's, that's it. I'm done. So that, that first year I made six figures, I was 22, 23. Yeah. And, uh, that first year I've made, I was probably working 15, 20 hours a week back then. And, uh, I wasn't utilizing my time. Well, I was just a dumb kid making some good money mm -hmm. for the first time. And so like, I didn't, I didn't do any personal development or anything. And I, I, I kind of regret that now, um, looking back, but you know, that was a, it was a sweet schedule for me. Cause I would just wake up, I'd go to the gym if I wanted to. And then I'd come back home, I'd play some video games and, you know, hang around, like hang around and then go out for like three hours at the end of the day, make some money and come back home. Yeah. And, uh, so now I think the biggest shift for me this past year to get really to where your question is, Harry, is I finally found something that I was super passionate about. Mm -hmm. And with that came the work that I'm putting into it because mm -hmm. you know, and everybody listening to the show, you're all podcasters. This is why you listen to the show. I'm sure you know that like, this isn't the, this, you know, John Lee Dumas is a one-off like we we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, he was, you know, fantastic content, insane work ethic, super disciplined, and he was really good timing with the podcasting industry. I think that that income level is possible still mm -hmm. doing podcasting. I just think it's going to take you or I a much longer time than it would yeah. take him to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so when I found something that I was super passionate about, it made the work easier to where it wasn't like, ugh, I can't believe I have to go get on this interview with somebody I really respect and admire and talk to them for 35 <laughs> minutes and like learn insights from them. You know, it was like, yeah. a, yes, now I get to go talk to this person. Um, and then, you know, Instagram and Facebook and everything is just all part of the whole gig. So like, I love giving back to people and I love when I get a message that says like, oh man, you, you helped me so much with this show. And, um, you know, like, thank you so much for putting out this content and all this stuff. Like I love getting stuff like that. So like all of this, this stuff doesn't really even feel like work that much to me, um, which really feeds into the effort that I put into it. But I also, I've, I feel like one skill that I do have, Harry, is I, I know how to work smart instead of just work yeah. hard. Um, a lot of people are about like the, the hustle and the grind and like all this stuff, but like they make way less money than I do because they, they feel like they have to be hustling all the time. So they just fill their time with a bunch of nonsense that doesn't actually produce and make them money. And it doesn't actually like feed into their business. They just feel like they got to be hustling. So they're doing stuff all the time and then they're super busy. They're super stressed and they're not that productive. Um, so I think that I'm really good at like picking out the tasks that I need to double down on and then giving whatever, you know, whatever isn't one of those tasks, giving it to somebody else and saying, Hey, you do this. So like there's zero chance I would be able to put out the amount of content that I do if I didn't have a podcast editor. Yeah. If I was doing all my shows every single time and like all that kind of stuff, there's no way I'd be able to do three days a week mm -hmm. because I spend any time that I've dedicated to my podcast, I spend on development trying to reach out to new guests, trying to network, trying to go to an event, trying to get in front of somebody that I eventually want to get on the show. That's where I spend all of my time. So if I started spending another 15 hours a week editing shows, uploading, writing show notes, like all that kind of stuff, then I would get super bogged down with all that stuff and I would be way behind where I am right now. And yeah, I pay for that. But in the end, my time is much better spent doing some of these other things. So I put out a lot of content and it's a lot harder work than I thought it was going to be. But in the end of the day, like I don't, I'm not spending 40 hours a week on it. I'm not, you know, I'm maybe 20 hours a week, um, doing the stuff that I do, maybe 25 or something like that. If you add in, you know, engaging on Facebook and Instagram, if you count that as work, um, then I would, then I would do that. My wife doesn't really count it as work. <laughs> I'm like, Hey babe, I'm working exactly. I'm on Facebook. And she's like, that's not work. Put it away. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but depending on what you, but you, what you view as work, I just think that I'm really good at figuring out the tasks that need to be done that only I can do. Yeah. And then giving those tasks that, you know, anybody can do to somebody else to do them. That's important. Uh, you touched on Instagram, and uh, I noticed I I, I, I catch uh, glimpses of them sometimes in the feed. But today's I, I caught, and I, I noticed that you had a little story about um, a, a speed bump that you hit uh, with regards to people you had booked on your show. And but then mm -hmm. ha then the way that turned out, I thought was really interesting, and it actually speaks to this concept of networking. So I wonder if you could tell that story really quick. Yeah. So this happened yesterday. Um, I had three big interviews lined up and they're all still on my schedule. It's yeah. not like they like said no and like we're done, but you know how it is when you have a bigger name that says yes 
and then they have to reschedule. It's just like, yeah. ah, is it really going to happen though? <laughs> like, am I really going to get put back on the schedule? Yeah. If I do get put back on the schedule, is it going to be in like three months from now? Like it was the first time I scheduled that because I've already been waiting three months yep. to get you to this point. And all this stuff goes by and these things are running through your head. And I had three interviews yesterday, all with pretty big names and literally all three of them rescheduled. So it was a day I was looking forward to for a long time. I was like, sweet, I'm going to interview these people. It's going to be fantastic. I'm going to have a blast. Yep. And then all of them rescheduled. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is stupid. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's going <laughs> to push me back like a lot longer on the yeah. goals that I had. Like this is, this is just ridiculous. And, um, so I was starting to get down on myself, but then my door to door instincts kind of kicked in and I was like, man, I've heard a lot worse rejections than this before. Mm -hmm. Um, cause, cause podcasting by the way, did bring a different knowledge of rejection to the table <laughs> because before, like when I knocked on somebody's door and like Joe Schmo told me to F off and yeah. get the F off his porch or whatever, like I don't really care because I don't really care what yeah. Joe Schmo thinks about me. But when somebody that I respected, admire that I'm trying to get to know and like learn from and they say no, then it's like, uh, it's a lot harder to detach myself emotionally from that. Yeah. But, um, I just look back to all the different times people have told me no. And I look back to all the different times people told me yes. And I was just like, you know what? It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to go do what I need to do. So I did a little bit more reaching out and, um, eventually I, I was able to book, um, I, I got Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, uh, finally to, to say yes yesterday. And then, um, the, my first ever billionaire interview, um, is it was also booked yesterday. Um, so after a day where I was just like super down on myself and, um, and wondering, you know, why am I doing this type thing? Um, I just switched that attitude, turned it around and then turned it into a really productive day where I got two confirmations from people that, you know, are two of the best guests I've ever had on the show. What I, what I love about that is that um, it's all those practices that you put into place and all that training, it sort of kicked in, you know, like like the people in the military say, like it's there, it's there, and when it, when it needs to come up, it just, you know, you can act on it. And I, and I get the sense that that's what happened. You know, you had a momentary lapse and you're just a bit down, but I think, like you said, your instincts, your door-to-door -door instincts kicked in. And yep. was there, you know, was there, there anything else from you? Because I, I, I get the sense that you also can see something like that and be like, oh yeah, what's, you know, what the, what's the lesson there? So I'm, I'm wondering if, if, yeah. if that now colors like a little bit of your mindset. Yeah, definitely. There's nothing. So a rule that I try to live by is the five minute rule. Um, because there, there's, there, there's nothing wrong with like being upset for a while. Like people think that like, you know, oh, you shouldn't be upset. You know, mm -hmm. like that's not a thing. It's like, well, like, look, sometimes you're going to have an emotional reaction, mm -hmm. but do what you got to do. But if you think about it longer than five minutes, now it's just a detriment. Now it's just negativity. Now it's just sucking energy out of you and sucking life out of you and not doing you any good. You know, have a release, like think about it, you know, yell the F-bomb if you have to, like whatever you got to do to like get yourself over it. But like as soon as that happens, you're done. Move on. Mm -hmm. The five minute rule is um, if it's not going to matter in five years, don't think about it longer than five minutes. Don't sulk about it longer than five minutes. And um, I, I truly believe that that is a, it's, it's such a powerful thing. We spend so much time being negative and we spend so much time exuding a bad energy because mm -hmm. of something that happens when we have have literally no control over that and it's already happened and the only thing that we're doing is feeding into more negativity for our future so why are we going to do it why are we going to spend time on it why are we going to think about it just stop thinking about it and then uh, figure out what you got to do to make today productive now and move on because in five years that's not going to matter yeah that's so important and i think um it's uh, uh, something my wife mentioned was this idea of uh making the gap between uh like the ob the observation having something affect you and then your reaction to it you know just mm -hmm. like making sure that like having that gap be wider like cognizant of the fact that you can make that gap wider so when you see something that would normally trigger you you know immediately if you know if it's a reflective response you're just going to be like ah mm -hmm. just immediately like scream out but the more of, of a gap you can put in between those uh, into those into those spaces i think you just get better and better at, and i think what you described was just like a perfect a uh, way to test it out and see yeah. if, if at least put a, have a tool you know something in your back pocket that you can think of it's like oh that was interesting uh you know travis yeah. said mm, i'm gonna try it out next time the, the ability to take yourself out of a situation and detach yourself emotionally from reacting and um and be able to uh, put in a plan based on what's happening as if you didn't have that emotional reaction is i mean that's that skill set is invaluable and uh, i was actually just listening to a podcast with tim ferris where he was talking about that about 
that gap in between an event that happens and your reaction emotionally to that event, yeah. pulling yourself out of the situation, almost like forcing yourself to have an out of body experience to where you're like looking at the situation intrinsically, not as a member involved in the situation. Mm -hmm. And that will allow you to be able to think about it in a more logical way and stay away from all the negative, um, feelings that you may have, uh, going forward in that situation. Totally, totally makes so much sense. Um, you've had so many interesting conversations with people that, uh, you know, a, a year ago, you wouldn't even thought you'd be speaking with. Uh, so this may be hard to, to, to pick one or two, but, uh, similar to something you talk about on your show, um, wh what's a relationship with, uh, a mentor that stands out for you? Um, so far in your journey with a mentor specifically yeah what comes to mind you know i know that that you know we have we always have several along the way but is there one that you know really you know you hold true and do, uh, near and dear to your heart um really probably one of my biggest mentors is john lee dumas um i know we kind of already talked about him um but i think that was probably the my biggest win was being able to um, not just spend some time with him, but be able to cultivate a real actual friendship and relationship with the guy. Um, I just shot him a text yesterday, um, saying thank you and appreciate you and stuff like that. And he sent me something back saying kind of the same thing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, having, having a relationship with somebody like that, who's been on this road, who's like had a lot of successes, who has a fantastic inner circle, um, has been able to like that has opened me up to so many more opportunities, allowed me to get so many more people, like the people that I'm getting on my show right now, I would definitely not be getting if it were not for the relationship that I have with John yeah. and he didn't directly introduce me to these people right like maybe one or two of the people that I've had on he's directly introduced me to but a lot of it is just like my name is now thrown in the mix with yeah. somebody like John right it's all credibility it's all the law of association um, being in the being in the mix with John and hanging out with you know him and Michael O'Neill and Jordan Harbinger and Omar Zenholm and people like that in Australia um, and then I just got out of a meeting um, just got done um, in Bradley Lee's studio uh, doing a podcast with Brad um, and then Elena Cardone walks in and I had and I had her on my show a little while ago she gave me a big hug and um, I saw things were going and stuff like that and then Grant walks in and then the VP his VP of sales Jared walks in I talked to Jared for a bit get his number get him on the show like like all of that stuff yeah. has all stemmed from learning to create the relationship that I did with John um, so that's been that's been really really valuable for me. I think what's an important takeaway there that is anyone who is listening could just sub, you know, take out podcasting or specifically, you know, um, you know, you know, John, a lot of people know about John here, but you could just use that same example. I know that there's someone in your network that you could think of right now who could, you know, re replace John's name with that person and you could go build a relationship or decide that that's someone you want to have a relationship with and do exactly, you know, something similar to what Travis did. So, yep, uh, exactly. I know that's going to inspire a lot of people to, to, to rethink, you know, their, their relationships with their mentor, with their potential mentors, even someone they haven't met. Yeah. Yeah. P find somebody and then just figure out a way to add a lot of value to them. Yeah. Um, like, like most influencers, like when you're a proponent of what they put out. Mm -hmm. So even if that means you don't have eight grand to go drop on a mastermind, you know, obviously that's going to get you, you know, way closer to him in a yeah. lot period, of, like a smaller period of time. Like I actually spent one on one time at his house mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico. Like that obviously is going to like get me a, like a much deeper relationship and a better friendship, like a lot quicker. Yeah. But just being like, hey, look, if I want to build a relationship with John, I know he's got Podcasters Paradise. I know that he's got the Freedom Journal, the Mastery Journal. I'm just going to be a big proponent of what he's putting out. Yeah. Go join his Facebook groups, like um, comment on his stuff. Like the more that you're in that, the more your name comes up. And then next time you're at a conference, you're like, oh, hey, John, I'm you know, Michael, I'm in your Facebook group. I said this thing the other day that you commented back on. Remember that? Oh yeah, great. Cool. Right. Um, and then, and then go from there and then just try to push out his stuff, but don't go up to people and like do it the spammy way. Like people, people literally go up to people now and be like, Hey, how can I add value to you? <laughs> like, and asking that question you would think is like a, Oh yeah, I'm leading with value. Yeah. Right. But like, it's such a, it's such a leading with value question that it's like not leading with value. Does that make sense? Like it's so it, transparent yeah. at this point now. Right, right, exactly. And I, I was talking to, do you know uh, J.P. Sears, Harry? 
Uh, I've known the name. I haven't met him. No. Okay. So JP is, uh, he does a lot of like, uh, comedy videos and stuff on YouTube yeah. and on Facebook. He, um, has long red hair, red beard. And, uh, he just does a lot of like really good comedy videos. He has like a, a coaching business and stuff that sure. his comedy videos help him do. He's got hundreds of millions of views on, yeah. on YouTube and everything like that now. So I was like, JP, what's like the most annoying question that somebody can come to you an event and, and, uh, and ask you. And he goes, I think the most annoying question is, how can I add value to you or how can I be of service to you or something like that? And I was like, what do you say to that? And he goes, well, the best way you can, um, the best way that you can add value to me is, uh, by not asking me that question, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> and it's just like, it was just a funny uh, way to put it because it's just, it, it's such a, like you're asking that question to try to prove that you don't have exactly. a hidden agenda, yeah. but then <laughs> that question itself implies that you have a hidden agenda so like you're shooting yourself in the foot yeah. to see if you can walk you know and it just doesn't make any sense so avoid that question try to come up with a real way to add value like when i was at john's house i wasn't like hey john how can i add value to you and help you i didn't i didn't say that but when he had there when when a window of opportunity opened up for me to be like hey i can help you with that sales thing it was an obvious way for me to add value to him. And, um, that's ultimately what, what created a relationship. It wasn't just me paying money to be there. It was the fact that like I put myself back in front of him and I worked a couple events, which got me to be able to hang out with him, get advice from him, like rub shoulders with him, hear from him, like listen to his conversations with other people, like all that kind of stuff, um, was what allowed me to, to, to be in the position that I am now. Very, very valuable takeaways. And this is, yeah, I, lo I love the fact cause it's just, applicable in like real life people can take immediately what you said and then try something out tomorrow so that's why i really think it's i think a lot of value so thank you for sharing that uh just a couple of questions as we wrap up what's something that you've changed your mind about recently hmm that is a good question something that i've changed my mind about hopefully you can edit this out harry because i'm not to think about this one for a second <laughs> Of course, uh, of course, by saying that, loyal listeners will know that I may actually just leave that in. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. We're just sitting here staring at each other. and Yeah, it's, it's getting real awkward. <laughs> um, something, I would, something that I've changed my mind about. That's a really good question, man. Um, I think I've changed my mind about kind of what we were talking about earlier about um, – like when I originally was jumping on this podcasting train, I was like, I'm going to be the next John Lee Dumas. I'm going to make a million dollars next year type thing. And when I first started, I was like, that's completely unrealistic. It's not going to happen. But I think recently I've changed my mind about, um, the fact that anybody can really make that happen. And because before, you know, at the beginning I thought it was a for sure thing. Then like after doing it for like six, uh, for after doing it for like three or four months, I was like, uh, I don't think this is something that, you know, anybody can do. And I'm, I'm probably not something that I, I can do. Um, but then recently I think I've changed my mind back to my original opinion, which is anybody can do this. It's just going to take a longer period of time. Um, that runway is just going to be a little bit longer because the the space is more crowded. Um, there's more things to learn. There's um, uh, all that kind of stuff. But the number one thing is if you look at it from a scarcity mindset, then you're going to believe that there's scarcity. So if you look at it from the fact that like, man, all the, you know, there's, you know, there's only a certain amount of podcasters that can make this much money. You know, there's only a certain amount of coaches that can make this much money. There's only a certain amount of mentorships or mentors or whatever, whatever you do that can make this much money. Then that's what you're going to believe. And you're going to look for evidence to support what you believe. But if you can um, come at it from an abundance mindset and think there's enough to go around for everybody. Like, yeah, John Lee Dumas may be making $5 million off podcast, but I don't see why I can't do that. Yeah. And then just figure out a way to make it happen. Yeah, you can do it. You know, like, like I said, the runway might be a little longer because the timing isn't as good as it was. And, you know, like timing is a, a really big factor and stuff like this. And the timing just isn't as good as it used to be. But it's funny because I say think long term, Harry, but like the long term that I'm talking about isn't like 35 years. Yeah. You know, it's like three to five years. It's not yeah. 35 years. It's like three to five years. You could be having the same results, you know, like it took John six months to start getting up into like the, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of downloads and stuff on his show. Yeah. And then now he's in the millions and stuff. But, you know, I, I may not be able to do that within six months like John was able to, but three years. Yeah. 
I, that's realistic. Like, I, I think that I could do that. The, 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 the type of guests I'm getting on my show now within six months of launch are fantastic guests. Mm-hmm. So if I keep going on this at this rate, like over the next year and a half, two years, then yeah, why not? Why would I not be able to hit those numbers? Like those numbers are definitely realistic. It's just going to take me a little bit you know, longer to get to that point. And uh, once you have stuff like that, then you can really start to monetize and bring in a really good income um, on just a podcast. If somebody else has done it, you can do it. Like, don't stop, stop thinking that like, you know, you know, stop, stop coming up with excuses for yourself of why you can't make it happen. Um, because it, you definitely can. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. Cause I had another question, but I, I just love the fact that you, <laughs> I'm glad I waited for this answer because <laughs> I was like, the longer you were taking, the more I knew that there was like something good coming. So it forced <laughs> me to wait even longer. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> so, and you delivered brother i'm so happy man good, that, that was good. So, so, so good so um thank you so much for taking the time and and coming on here it, it was you know all that i expected it would be and, and, I, and I know you provide a, a ton of knowledge for my audience so i appreciate you for that awesome well yeah i, I really appreciate that man thanks for thanks for having me on i've been looking forward to it yeah so where's the best place for folks to track you down online yeah, best place is uh, I spend a lot of time on Facebook. So, um, really, I spend a lot of time in our Facebook group, as, as you know, Harry. Um, and I, I post a lot of just different valuable things when I go throughout the day. I've never gone live on actual Facebook. Actually, take that back. I think I did once. Okay. But I go live in my Facebook group pretty often and just share like a networking tip or strategy or some takeaway that I just learned or something like that. So, I spend a lot of time on Facebook um, and I spend a lot of time on Instagram. So, on Facebook, um, you can just search Travis Chapel. And if you're friends with Harry or anybody else in this space, then I'm sure I'll come up. Yeah. Um, or Travis.Chapel15, I believe, is my exact um, quote-unquote username for Facebook. So if you search that in the, in the search bar, I'll definitely come up. Um, or just to make it easier, you can just go to buildyournetwork.co. So buildyournetwork.co forward slash FB. Um, there's a free ebook there on how to network in Facebook groups. And then the link to my Facebook group is right there underneath that ebook. So just hit that link, join my Facebook group, and I'm obviously in there. And then you can find me from them, from my Facebook group and add me as a friend. Shoot me a Facebook message, say what's up. I'm always down to chat. Um, or if you'd like to use Instagram better, then um, I'm on Instagram. I'm at Travis Chapel, C H A P P E L L. So um, yeah, just go to buildyournetwork.co forward slash FB to find me on Facebook. Or go to uh, Instagram and search for at Travis Chapel. I spend a lot of time on both those platforms. Thanks again, brother. I uh, appreciate you. I hope you have a fantastic week. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Appreciate it. How about that conversation with Travis? It's always nice when I get to meet someone in person, find out that they're doing really interesting things, end up having them on the show, end up being on their show, end up seeing them in Vegas, end up seeing them at another podcasting conference. And that's how my relationship with Travis has gone. And I just see it getting more fun and better. And he's just such a great guy. So I'm supporting everything he's doing. He recently had Grant Cardone on his podcast, which came out after this was recorded. And that was a big deal for him because he ended up uh, recording it from Grant's studio in Miami. So it was nice to see him post that on Facebook. This thing about connecting with friends and through podcasts has just been so meaningful to me. I was recently on my friend John Nastor's podcast. He's the host of Hack the Entrepreneur. And I've always looked at that podcast from afar as an entrepreneur and saying, wow, it would be nice to be on there one day. And I, I didn't feel the need to ask John until I felt like I was ready with my business. And that moment happened and it is episode 420. I'm sure there's a joke in there for those that are well aware of the medicinal qualities now available in certain herbs in California and the episode number. If you didn't get that, then you can ignore what I just said. <laughs> Don't forget our full show notes, which cover everything we mentioned in the show, including the links, including the quotes, including the timestamps, including the summary, including the artwork. Our team does such a great job, and uh, it'd be a shame if you didn't check those out every now and then. Podcastjunkies.com forward slash 167. As always, thanks and thanks and thanks to my good friend, George Abiana, aka Cedar and Soil, cedarsoil.com for creating that memorable four years ago podcast junkies intro music tune in next week for my conversation with erica mandy she's the host of the newsworthy a nice 10 minute update on the news she actually got me to the point where i was listening to news again i had deleted the news app from my phone i was just so depressed with what i was hearing and seeing and uh, she renewed my faith in uh, lighthearted and, and fun not always lighthearted depending on the news topic but she delivers in a way that's um, 
Very nice and very personable, and that's just her personality. We reconnected recently at NAB in Las Vegas. We were part of a panel together, so it's been nice to continue to bump into my podcasting friends here and there across the potosphere. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter to see, receive the weekly updates. It was on a bit of a lull as I was changing mail systems from ConvertKit to Active Campaign. Send me an email if you'd like to ask me why. <laughs> Uh, so all these forms had to change and then the, the updates, the actual episodes were on hold. So you'll, if you're on the list now, you'll see them coming about every three days just till we get caught up. I do make it a, a point to actually let you know about every single guest, even if I have to go back 10 episodes to get caught up on the emails. I owe it to my guests to do that, to notify you uh, that they've been on the show and try to reach you in every way possible. So that's why you'll see it posted on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and on medium.com, on YouTube, and an email, because I never know where I'm going to catch you. And I've even gotten feedback from the news, the newsletters that people saw a guest there that they hadn't seen previously. So if you're a podcaster, make sure your, your outreach is across every single platform, because uh, you want to be where the conversation is happening, and it's not always on your preferred platform. To continue to receive those updates, it's podcastjunkies.com forward slash eight tools, and you can sign up for our new newsletter courtesy of Active Campaign. This is a long time to wait for a retention hashtag, and if you're here, I appreciate you. Big hug. We're going to go with Networking Travis, all one word, hashtag Networking Travis, T-R-A-V-I-S, and you can tag Travis at Travis C. Chapel. so there's an extra C in there, it's T-R-A-V-I-S-C-C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L. So two C's, two P's, two L's. And of course, us at podcast underscore junkies. Thanks for all you do. Thanks to all my friends, my podcasting peeps, to Dave Jackson, who just me, had me on School of Podcasting. That should be out by the time this episode is out as well. He interviewed me there, so keep an eye out for that. And don't forget to check out my interview with uh, John Nastor on Hack the Entrepreneur. And until then, let's have a fantastic week together and celebrate our wins and share another podcaster's story, shall we? <laughs>